if you're looking at a dish of lasagna that has just the amount of oil swimming in it, the meat is just looks seasoned to perfection. The sauce looks wonderful. It doesn't look dry. Mm -hmm. If it looks like what you had at grandma's house, it becomes its own character. And it doesn't even have a line of dialogue. Faded? Cut two. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant? Bar, club, day, night, action. Yo, what's going on, everyone? And welcome back to Restaurant Fiction, the podcast that reviews every single fictional restaurant, bar, and club in TV and film, as well as give you an insider perspective by talking to the fine men and women who have had a hand in said fictional restaurant, bar, and club. I'm your host, Monis Rose. Today's fictional restaurant, excuse me, fictional kitchen, is Julie Powell's Kitchen from the 2009 film Julie and Julia. How did we pick this fictional kitchen, if you will? Well, it's because of our awesome guest. You see, usually restaurant fiction talks to the creators of the TV show or the directors of the film or the showrunners, producers, and even chefs. But for this episode, we are talking to one of our favorite film critics, Gail Bass. Who is Gail? Besides being the best film critic in Phoenix, Arizona, she has also co-hosted the Arizona Lifestyle Show, Your Life A to Z, and today co-host the popular TV show right this minute. And on a personal note, I met Gail back in 2002 at a press screening for the second Harry Potter film. She helped me with the craft of film critiquing as a high school student and many moons later, and after losing touch with her for a number of years, she she graciously accepted an invitation to be our guest. You see, guys, in a world where everyone now is a film critic, there is still one person whose voice rises above all of the other Rotten Tomato reviewers out there, and that's Gail's. All right, before we start this very special episode, if you, our beautiful listener, our beautiful audience, could do just one thing, only one thing to help our show, Restaurant Fiction, out and that is to tell one other person, only one other person, not five, not 10, not even two, just one about this episode you're about to listen to or any of our 30 plus episodes. We rely on you to spread the word to grow restaurant fiction. So if you don't mind, pause this episode right now, text a friend, who'd love to hear about the inner workings of Moe's Tavern from The Simpsons, Nipsey's from the show Martin, or The Peach Pit from Beverly Hills 90210, and send them the iTunes link or the link to wherever you are listening to this podcast. All right. Without any further ado, here is Restaurant Fiction's review of Julie Powell's Kitchen and our interview with Gail Bass. Go. All right, so guys, You know, cozy kitchens are what restaurant fiction prefers. You see, there's something about a cozy kitchen, a lived-in kitchen that has no fluidity in terms of design or feng shui that makes us smile because that means it's lived in, that there has been a cook, a chef, a family, a person who has really used every single pot and pan in this entire space. We were invited to a dinner party of Julie Powell. And why is she important? Why does she carry resonance? Well, it's because of this cozy kitchen. This cozy kitchen works magic. It works Julia Child magic. What do I mean? That she invites us to this dinner party and we have a plethora of Julia Child famous concoctions. Number one, let's go with the bruschetta. The bruschetta is something very, very simple, you know, for someone that doesn't 
consider himself or herself a foodie, well, guess what? Just one bite and you taste the fresh tomato with the olive oil and the basil, you're going to instantly become a foodie, whether you like that term or not. Then we move on to the French onion soup. With us at Restaurant Fiction, yes, you can say, oh, it's all about the caramelization of the onions. You know, it's, is it sweet or is it bitter? No, it's about the cheese for us, the gooier cheese, the melt, the ooze, the goos, however you want to say that. You know, the beef bourguignon. Uh, people say, you know, that is the quintessential dish for us. You know, it is just like a beef stew that Julie in her cozy kitchen does very well. What we really prefer is that her beef actually maintains its structure. It's not like a filet mignon, which turns into some kind of chocolate beef if it's stewed for hours on end. In this cozy kitchen, we were really, really amazed of the duck stuffed in pastry. You know, it is a dish that we have never seen on a restaurant menu. For a person to debone an entire duck, cook it in a teeny tiny stove without any name brand like Viking or Wolf or Sub-Zero, and for it to come out to perfection is beyond our wildest dreams. The Bavarian and chocolate cream pies for dessert, they're good, no complaints here. The only one complaint we have of this entire feast, if you will, is the lobster. We still do not know if we were going to get lobster thermidor, if we were going to get lobster bisque. But regardless, the lobster that we tasted was very tough, and it's because of the way the lobster was killed. You see, us at Restaurant Fiction, we are animal eaters, so animals do have to die, unfortunately. And with how to kill any species, if you will, especially the lobster, is... You want it to be painless. You do not want any kind of fear. And how Julie did kill her bugs was she hovered them over steaming water. Just that tenses up the lobster, so you're going to get tough meat regardless. So next time, if there is ever a next time, one and done. Kill the bug, then throw it in the pot. You're going to have the most tender meat ever. All right, so... Gail, that was the little review of Julie Powell's dinner party from her cozy kitchen in tiny Manhattan. What do you have to add? What do you have to say? Comments? Concerns? In that movie, what struck me the most food-wise is the bruschetta that she made. And instead of grilling it, she fried it in oil. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I, I have to eat that when I get home. So when I got home, I tried to make that. It didn't come out as well. But so now for breakfast, I'm having fried egg on a piece of toast that I'm going to fry in some smart, some smart balance. French food does have resonance. What about, though, this film and the food in this film? And of course, Julie's cooking and in her kitchen resonates with you. The attempt to cook that influenced me because I loved Julia Child. I just admired her cooking. I loved her delivery. And in the movie, you got a true appreciation for her and her husband, Paul, and how he was working for the State Department and the issues they were going through. But through all that, her joy of food never left her. And the fact that this young woman, Julie, tried to emulate that. She actually used her cookbooks. I have a ton of cookbooks, some of which I've never even cracked open. This woman actually went through the cookbook and tried to cook all the stuff in it. What does, though, French food say about the characters? Well, that she appreciates a good meal and that she's willing to adventure beyond beef and potatoes. So many people have such predictable diets. But the fact that you can go and get a recipe that has a funny name may be something you can't even pronounce. How many people can pronounce bouf bourguignon? And the fact that you're going to try it, which is basically a wonderful stew, like you said earlier. But the fact that you're willing to try different flavor profiles, that you're not being timid about going beyond hamburgers and french fries, pardon the pun, I think it's a good thing. I think it's that somebody's trying to do something just a little different. How important is her kitchen? Because obviously we spend a lot in Julia Child's kitchen throughout the movie, but what about, why is her cozy kitchen important? Because she made it work. She worked with what she had. She didn't have a fancy electrical lux. She didn't have a Viking stove. Well, they were living above over the pizza shop. 
and living in a small place, not a apartment like in on the TV show Friends. They were she made it work for her. And a lot of people think you need a lot of fancy stuff to make it work, and you don't. I have a coworker who says, you know what? If you can read, you can cook. And she showed that. She yes, she had some cooking talent, but you know what? If you can read, you can cook all kinds of interesting things. You don't have to have the fancy stove. Do I like the fancy stove? Absolutely, yes. At my parents' home, they have a great Electrolux. And whenever I go to that house, I cook something on it because it's great cooking on a really cool stove, but you don't need one. What is your process of reviewing the film? You know, what do you start with? What do you look for? I go in with a blank slate. And I basically like to just write down that one quote that I think captures what I'm watching. I just try to look at the whole story as a whole, the basics of filmmaking. Like, did they get the, if they point the camera in the right place in the right way, if the actors deliver their lines well, then hey, half the work is done. I specialize in the 60 to 120 minute pitch, like the tweeting of movie reviews. Will you like it? If you like this type of movie, if you like this type of action, yes. Yes, you could take your kids. No, don't take your kids. That kind of thing. You mentioned, you know, these like critic press screenings. You know, which do you prefer, say, a press screen over a regular screening with just a regular crowd? Do you prefer one over the other? For a press screening when it's press only, there's only a few people in the theater. And I'm wondering, because of the pandemic, if that will be more often to keep people separated. However, there's something about hearing an audience going ooh and ah at the same stunts and everything else. And just their laughter. It helps you remember what people go to the movies for because I'm going as a critic, but you know, general audiences go purely for entertainment. And I go for entertainment, but I'm also thinking of other things like what am I gonna tell people? Should they waste their money on this picture? And so it's nice to be there with an audience just to feel their reaction and the energy in the audience. The one time, this was before I was reviewing movies, but I remember distinctly when I saw Jurassic Park, when that T-Rex was attacking that explorer with the two kids inside, I saw everybody sinking down in their seats as if they were in the explorer. It was one of the most amazing theater experiences I ever had, watching the audience just Everybody sink down. Do you feel you, you do not get that because critics see so, so, so many movies every single year? No. We still okay. have our ability to laugh. There may be 10 people in the theater, but we still laugh when it's funny. What are challenges of, say, reviewing a film dealing with cooking or a restaurant? When you have a movie like that and you show the food, when the food looks good, that helps the movie work. There's a movie called What's Cooking? And it's a Thanksgiving movie. And I really liked it. And the food in that movie looked good. There's also a movie I enjoyed called Pieces of April that was about cooking. It's one of my favorite Thanksgiving movies. In this film, Katie Holmes is just like the family black sheep, but she decides that she wants to make Thanksgiving dinner for her family. She's living with this black guy in big city. Her mom is coming to visit with the dad and other kids, and she's trying to make this Thanksgiving meal. The problem is her stove isn't working, so she goes to a neighbor's house to help fix the stove. There's also a problem with another neighbor because that neighbor is a vegan or whatever it is. And, you know, what's really cool about that is it's the story around the food. A lot of times when you see food in a movie, it's some kind of familial scene. And it's all about the way the food looks and the flavor memory that you have in your mind. That's when it works. And then how can, though, a writer, you think, a writer and director, make, say, yeah, food more than just a ancillary product, you know, more than just a vehicle for characters to talk? If you're looking at a dish of lasagna that has just the amount of oil swimming in it, the meat is just, it looks seasoned to perfection, the sauce looks wonderful, it doesn't look dry. Mm -hmm. If it looks like, what you had at grandma's house, it becomes its own character. And it doesn't even have a line of dialogue. You are a writer and you're a TV host. How did you find your voice? I get to be myself. And that makes it easy to be authentic because 
for me, being a phony doesn't work. I'm not good at it. <laughs> I found my voice just doing the work. If you do the work every day, you go into work with wonder saying, what am I going to do today? What am I going to see today? What am I going to learn today? If you focus less on you and more on what you're doing, it becomes less about you because it, you know, if you focus on yourself too much, you become a person that nobody wants to be around and people will figure it out when they look at what you write and everything else. It comes out in all different parts of your life. What's one movie that you absolutely love that all of your fellow critics hated and, and vice versa? My guiltiest movie pleasure of all time has to be Ishtar. Ishtar bombed at the theaters. Nobody liked it. But for me, it's just one of those movies that just made me chuckle more than I expected to. Would I give it an award? No, but I didn't hate it. So yeah, I confess. My guilty movie pleasure is Ishtar. I haven't seen it in a number of years, and there are a lot of other candidates that could roll in there. You're writing your own movie. You know, you've seen so, so many in your lifetime. You want to give it, uh, give a screenplay a shot, and it needs to feature a fictional restaurant. What will your dream fictional restaurant look like? It wouldn't be like this big, fancy thing. It would be like a breakfast, lunch, early supper place. That would do comfort food. Like you could come in and get a peach pie to go, or you could sit down in the corner for three hours and not get kicked out. You could start with some creamy grits and end the day with like some beef bourguignon or something like that. Just foods that I like that may not even be from the same continent, but you could get just like eclectic cuisine and sit and talk for hours. There would be a big giant fireplace and none of the silverware would match. Because I want people who grew up like that to feel comfortable. And I want people who didn't grow up like that to just think it's kitschy. <laughs> you lived in Phoenix for quite some time now. What is the Gail Bass restaurant food tour? My friend runs Hillside Spot in Ahwatukee. I love that for lunch. They have a, they have a great menu there for lunch and dinner. Also... I love Tarbell's. Mark Tarbell has been a friend for a long time. And there's something about Mark's giant uh, meatballs that are just divine. He mixes veal and beef for his meatballs. And it's just like this wonderful, delicate flavor. But that's so substantial that I will never forget those ever in my life. It's one of the best things I ever ate. Gotcha. Well, you know, and, and Julie and Julie, you know, it's, French cooking, obviously that's what Julia Child is famous for. What is the best French meal you have ever had? Is it, is it this bruschetta? Is it something from France or from your travels at all? You're going to laugh when I tell you this. I studied French in high school. I went to France so I could practice my French a little bit to make high school worth it and college. And I have to say, it wasn't what I ordered. It's what my friend Ellen ordered. We were taking a bus trip from London to Paris for a few days. And we stopped at a little, like, truck stop. And at this truck stop, they had these sandwiches made with fresh bread. She had a simple sandwich. Fresh French pain, tomato, some fromage, some cheese. It was the most simple sandwich in the world. But they dressed it so well with some, you know, some nice fresh greens and the the olive oil concoction that they put on it it was the best thing i ever ate in france and i ate a lot of good stuff but that sandwich just the freshness alone just surprised me at this little, little bus stop thank you gail you're welcome back anytime all right so where can you watch julie and julia that's easy rent buy it on wherever you stream your content these days. As for Gail, you can watch her show right this minute. Check your local TV listings of where you can watch it. As for LA, Los Angeles, where this podcast is recorded, right this minute airs weekdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on KDOC TV. You can also follow her on Twitter. She's at Gail Bass, G-A-Y-L-E-B-A-S-S. -S. As for restaurant fiction, 
if you're feeling lucky, you can listen to as many episodes as your heart desires on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, as well as read our reviews on restaurantfiction.com. I'm Monis Rose, and until next time, keep it real, keep it fresh, and always keep it on the flip side. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Night.